Welcome to Healthy University, where we'll discuss issues and subjects on how you can live a healthier and more productive life. And now, here's your host for Healthy University, Alan Eisenberg. Hi, and welcome to Healthy University. This is your host, Alan Eisenberg, and I'm really uh, happy today because this is the first time I'm doing a vodcast podcast. So this, this time when you're watching it on YouTube, if you choose to, you're going to see like a TV show uh, with my guest. And I, I'm so happy to have my guest here. We connected through book sharing, and he's written a, an amazing book. His name is Dylan M. Coleman, Ph.D. He's the director of it the Anxiety Institute of Connecticut and author of Resolving the Anxiety Dilemma. He received his doctorate from Boston University where he trained at the Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders under the mentorship of psychologist David H. Barlow. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Alan. I tell you what, I, your book, uh, we were just talking a little before the show, and I, I had a couple of interesting things. One, when you sent me the book and I'm looking at it, I'm just like folding over page after page after page. I was like, I'm going to ask you all these questions. I'll and then that. and then you sent me your questions and they matched my questions. So hopefully with the audience will connect. But I also, I went on a peace retreat this weekend. I'd never done that before. And one of the I ironic things, of course, is that I'm a highly sensitive person male. So I'm, I'm kind of this unique being in the world, 20% of us, not really that unique. But I get there and it's 32 people, 30 women and two men. And I knew it was going to be like that. I'm like, I know it's going to be like that because women are so much more honest with their emotions and they're so much more um, wanting to find peace, I think, than, than men are willing to do that. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting is I got to practice my coaching, which is not what you do in, as a therapist, of course. Um, but everybody I coach, you know, I always start by tell me how you got to this point of wanting to move forward and every one of them. Anxiety, 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 anxiety. So I went through anxiety. I couldn't leave my house at one point. Um, what is it? What is what did you find out is anxiety and why why do you have a passion for it? Well, you know, anxiety uh, is a is a basically a feeling. It's a sense of apprehension or dread about something that uh, might happen in the future. It's, it's useful to distinguish anxiety from fear, which is a very related uh, uh, feeling state. If you're walking down a jungle path and you were thinking to yourself, there might be a tiger, there might be a tiger, there might be a tiger. That apprehensive state is anxiety where the threat uh, we perceive is in the future and it's not inevitable. We have a sense of might to it. We might encounter a tiger. If the ferns rustled on the side of the path and you believe oh, there's a tiger right there, you would have a, a surge of fear, which is a panic attack. Uh, with fear, we have a, a sense of imminent danger or believe that we're threatened right now. So uh, oftentimes people suffer from both fear and anxiety. They have a lot of what it, uh, there might be a tiger and also there's a tiger right there. Uh, very common and uh, commonly co-occurring feeling states. Yeah, and I think I can cross that off. That was one of my extra questions for you. Hey, what's anxiety and fear? And there, you just said it. But, <laughs> right. but what's interesting about it to me, and what what I kind of tell me, you know, if I'm if I'm on the right track, one of the issues is that I tell people is we're animals, and all animals have fight or flight. And right. at the end of the day, anxiety is sort of a broken fight or flight instinct that then your <laughs> mind gets trapped in. Is that is that somewhat of a truth? I think that's a, yeah, there's a lot to that. I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, in the context of our, our natural history 150,000 years ago, uh, anxiety would be associated with actionable threats, things we could actually do something about. So we'd be anxious, let's say, about the, the possibility of predation or starvation or isolation. So uh, anxiety would be evoked by things like tigers. Mm -hmm. And by, by avoiding that anxiety, we not just moved away from anxiety, we also moved uh, away from tigers. So it worked quite well uh, by avoiding the anxiety evoked by the tiger, we'd also avoid the tiger itself. But in 2017, we still feel that same feeling state and it's often not associated with actionable threats, threats we can do mm -hmm. things about. So when we move away from it, we're not uh, moving away from actionable dangers in the world anymore, we're just moving away from a feeling 
and that's how things get highly disruptive in our lives. And does that really, like today, we just don't, like when we were hunter-gatherers, right, when we lived in nature, we, there were these threats around us, but it seems like now, like, we're internal, we're dealing with internal threats, like, you know, we're afraid at work that we're not doing a good job and that sets off something, or right. uh, these, these other things that shouldn't have, have led to this instinctual reaction are now much, we're much more sensitive because somehow we've come up with things to replace the tiger. Does that right. make sense? Exactly, yeah. Um, it's true that in today's world, actual threats, well, they're po it's possible one could feel mm -hmm. anxious in the presence of, of a person or a situation that's actually threatening. And in that case, the ancient mechanism of anxiety works very well. I don't think that situation arises often in one's life, but it, it, it does occur. Um, you, you're referring largely to the, the social experiences we have when anxiety arises. From an evolutionary perspective, you know, uh, rejection by one, we lived in, in, in clan environments, our, our mm -hmm. situations, and being ostracized by one's clan or close uh, community was really a life-threatening affair. Uh, it was, it's hard to survive as a human being in isolation. So today that fear still lingers in our hearts to some extent. And when we experience the, the prospect of rejection, even though it's essentially mm -hmm. a harmless experience today, it still evokes these, this, this primal sort of anxiety and fear. And I, and I feel like we're, yeah, we're with, with the lack of communication, particularly verbal that we're in today people are misreading things at a higher level. Like there's just more, when we communicate together, like I can tell how you feel, you know, there's just, even though I say I'm an HSP and I sort of have this empathic feeling about someone, mm -hmm. um, I still feel like we've cut our communications to the point now that we have fear of communicating, which mm -hmm. leads to anxiety. And so our younger generation, I feel like I see that a lot, like, I call uh, a twenty-something into my office at work, and they're nervous. Like, right. I've got to face you, and I've got to talk to you. And why would you do that to me? And that's like, I, I can feel their anxiety. And it's like, don't be anxious. We're just going to have a conversation. Sure. Yeah, there is something to that evolutionary mismatch that we have these uh, biological systems, including emotional systems, our, our bodies and brains, that were really uh, designed as the wrong word, but it, it conveys the idea. Uh, by evolution to help us meet the demands of paleolithic conditions uh, when we were dealing with uh, you know, uh, issues of predation and foraging for food and things like that. So our bodies and brains aren't that different today than they were 150,000 years ago, evidence would suggest, particularly our emotions, yet our world is so radically different. So, you know, in my book, it's like I, I, I use this metaphor, it's like, it's like uh, taking a snowmobile to commute to work in July, it's going to get there. But it's going to be a bumpy ride. Mm. So that's what it's like to be a person uh, in the modern world. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to pause for a minute. Uh, okay. So, so tell me, you, you, you named your book The Anxiety Dilemma. What is the anxiety dilemma? What is the dilemma we have? Well, the dilemma is sort of a three-part problem. The first part is that anxiety is part of life. It's just part of the human condition to experience this feeling state. It's not an aberration are uh, inherently a pathological uh, condition. Uh, anxiety is part of the experience of being a person in the world. The second part though is that we have this ingrained tendency to move away from anxiety because historically, evolutionarily speaking, it was linked to things like predation. So we have this deep inclination to move away from this feeling. But the third part is because anxiety is part of life, we disrupt our lives accidentally by avoiding it automatically. Mm -hmm. When we have put this feeling in an automatic, knee-jerk sort of way, because it's associated with, with neutral and even positive or beautiful parts of our lives, we're accidentally disrupting our lives when we avoid it uh, in this ancient sort of capacity. Um, so, and, you know, there, this is magnified by a particular quality of anxiety, which is to hone in on things of value. If you're walking around town with two bags in your hands, one filled with gold and one filled with dog poop, and a robber threatens to take your belongings, you're, you're only worried about the gold. You're not worried about the dog poop. So anxiety is, is a feeling that arises when something of value seems threatened. In mm. Our mm. jobs, our physical well-being, our relationships with others, for example. 
And so because of that, it has this unique tendency to, to target things of value, to show up where we have things that are important in our lives that we don't want to lose. So when you combine that with our tendency to avoid anxiety, you have a real dilemma. We're, we're recoiling from anxiety, and anxiety has a tendency to show up uh, in, in domains of our lives of importance. So yeah. that's we're disrupting not just our lives at random, but we're disrupting our lives in cr critical or key areas. And, and you know, one of the interesting things I say to people is, when you're in these states, you're really in a battle with your mind. You know, one of the, one of the things I feel, at least, and I talk about it as a coach, is that we we think our minds control us, but we actually can control our minds. We just don't think about it. We don't work at it. And then our minds start to do so. Like, we, like for me, obviously, it was bullying, and it disrupted my life, and it affected me down to uh, CPTSD that, you know, uh, disrupted my life and eventually put me in an anxious state. I was pretty much in an anxious state from 13 to 40. <laughs> and, and that disruption, um, I think, was, you know, obviously brought on by what happened to me but at the same time i didn't have any skills to go to battle with my mind right didn't didn't realize this thing what kind of skills like what kind of things do you see you know i think you say like anxiety the question people ask is anxiety dangerous mm -hmm. why is it not and and what are the skills that you come you need to come to battle with when you're battling anxiety well, essentially, it's not dangerous because we're built to bear it. You know, it, we're built to sustain this this feeling. It is a normal part of, of being a person. In fact, it's a normal part of being a creature. If you observe animals uh, in their natural environment, uh, you'll see that they experience a range of feelings. Or we infer this, of course. They mm -hmm. can't tell us this. But uh, their behavior seems to reflect a whole range of feeling states. If you watch a squirrel, for example, uh, this time of year or in fall in general, you'll see playful moments. The squirrel exhibit playful behavior and relaxed behavior, but also anxious and fearful behavior. Mm -hmm. So anxiety is, is not dangerous in large part because we're built to bear it. Throughout the history of the human condition, we talk about this being the age of anxiety, which is a uh, interesting, although questionable uh, claim. I think there's something to it that people are especially anxious now. But people were anxious in, in uh, primitive times. People were anxious in medieval times. People were anxious during the world wars. Mm -hmm. Life has never been a peaceful state for humans or any other creature. There should be peaceful moments. But prolonged peace or equanimity is just not part of the bag of being a person. So we're built to bear this condition, and it, it simply doesn't harm us. Uh, that's not to say that a lifetime of chronic anxiety might be a cardiovascular risk factor, for example. Mm -hmm. like, uh, concerns. We want to manage anxiety for that reason, but no episode of anxiety is going to kill us. Um, in terms of the tools, you know, we, we know that there's two real evidence-based strategies for dealing with anxiety problems. There's cognitive behavioral therapy, a uh, form of psychotherapy that's been widely demonstrated to be effective for anxiety issues, and there's pharmacotherapy, uh, which is, you know, the use of medication to manage anxiety problems. For some anxiety problems, uh, the, both CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy and medicines uh, can be effectively combined. And for others, what research shows is that CBT does better on its own, particularly in the case of panic disorder. You actually have better outcomes if you use with no medicines to treat them. Yeah. Um, so you have these two approaches, and with CBT, the type of uh, treatment that I'm really qualified to talk about, I'm not a real expert in, in pharmacotherapy. Um, you know, basically, you can think of CBT as a tool bag of evidence-based strategies. There's relaxation training and cognitive restructuring, most importantly, exposure therapy, and newer uh, treatments uh, involved in use of mindfulness or attention control strategies. I don't think of it as just a tool bag of things that work, or what I think of as a single sweeping change in our relationship to anxiety. And I call this, you know, this GTNA change go through it, not away, GTNA. So when anxiety stands between us and the things we care about, if we're at point A and what we value deeply is at point B, we're best served going through anxiety instead of recoiling away from it. And if you broke that into parts, that big change, I, I call it a calm adjustment, which stands for courage, attention control, letting go, and management. So those are that's my way of sort of framing 
the the cognitive behavioral strategies that work for anxiety problems. And you know, you know it's funny because I, I go back to myself and and certainly I did CBT training. That was my therapist. Obviously, was like, okay, we you know that's that's the main focus. But I'm also a talker, and mm -hmm. so I was shutting down. Right, I was embarrassed and I was like, I think I'm crazy. And yes. you know, like like I was having this thing where when I went to the barber and they put the the thing around my neck, I was having a panic attack because I felt oh, trapped yeah. in the chair, right? I was having these claustrophobic panic attacks. And it was so funny because as I talked to, to other people, because I was willing to, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that it's like, hey, I want to I wanna discover. And I, you know, self-studied some books. One of the books I, I was reading, I, you know, I'm on a page and it goes, some people experience anxiety when they're sitting in a barber chair and they put the thing around. I'm like, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not crazy. And then, then I actually started, you know, both using CBT and talk therapy, but, but I also started talking to myself. I would look in the mirror and I would say, today, you're not going to, you're not going to have this happen. You know, mm -hmm. today you're going to be brave. And today, and after a while, like I say, I think it's a battle with my mind. After a while, my mind started to believe what I was saying. And right. Then I've even read about being able to do a try to be a third person. Like you start having a panic attack, and and the first thing try to say is like, "Hmm, my body's acting this way. Why is it acting this way?" And start questioning your own body as to why it's doing it. Right. You ever heard of that? Well, certainly self talk can be useful. Yeah. And cognitive reframing, which is another way to describe what you're what you're doing. I think I might just slightly reframe what you're describing with the battle of the mind. I think you're describing a battle of your legs. It's mm. about willing yourself to go to the barber's chair. Uh, it's about willing yourself to enter into work when you feel fearful or anxious. Uh, you know, basically people, like all creatures, learn, learn mostly through firsthand experience by observing with our own eyes. So we learn that the barber chair is safe. And that we don't, and that the feelings of, of fear and apprehension we feel when we're in that chair, which it has to do with agoraphobic feelings, the feeling mm -hmm. that escape may be difficult if we feel it intensely uh, fearful. Yeah. Uh, that that those feelings won't hurt us. That chair won't hurt us. The barber won't hurt us. We observe that by, like a dog observes that the vet is safe by doing it. So the battle over the mind is more a battle over one's legs and arms and body to 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 will ourselves to go from point A to point B, even when anxiety is in the middle. And that's when we will acquire uh, tremendous amounts of new data to help us overcome these issues. Yeah, and it's like you said, you, you're going, you need to go through it. Like, I, I tell people a story all the time that I deal with, you know, a lot, a lot of in the recovery is, you know, exercise to me is one of those things as a coach, I'm always telling people, you know, I actually say three, three things. First, you got to get sleep. If you're not getting seven to eight hours, if your sleep's disrupted, you're not going to be able to help yourself because your mind is so tired. You know, it's you're exhausted. So figure out the sleep, right? Then right. I say after that, it's exercise and nutrition because both of them lead to those good, good chemicals going to the brain. Mm -hmm. I said that's that's the triple the triple t attack that I like, and yeah. and I know you know. It, it was a forced thing for a long time, you know, you, you just have to do it. But I love this message that's outside my gym that I didn't read till I needed to re read it, which said knowing that getting here was half the battle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, well, they know all about anxiety, don't they? They know all about these things. We have to take a quick break, Dylan, but when we come back, I'd like you to of course, tell us a lot more about what, what you've learned and, and what you studied and then how people can get your book and get in touch with you. So okay, if you'll hold good. on, if you'll hold on, we'll be right back with more Healthy You. Thank you. You're listening to Healthy University with Alan Eisenberg.
Hi, and welcome back to Healthy You. This is your host, Alan Eisenberg, and I'm here with Dylan M. Coleman, PhD, who's a specialist in anxiety disorders. And he has just written a book called Resolving the Anxiety Dilemma. And he's talked to us a little bit about what that dilemma is. But let's roll into worry, you know, because I think it starts somewhere. It starts with stress and worry, and then anxiety builds from there, right? So how does the phenomena of worry work? How, does, how do we get that point? Mm, yeah, worry is very complicated in its own way. And if you understand how worry works, which is a, a symptom of anxiety, you understand quite a bit about the anxious experience in general. So at the end of the day, most anxiety problems are really avoidance problems. It's not so much that we have this feeling state of anxiety, it's that we take these measures without really knowing it to avoid the feeling, to recoil and pull back away from it. Sometimes this is relatively easy to understand. So take the example, for example, of uh, someone with obsessive compulsive disorder, while there's many, many forms of OCD, uh, one, one common variety is when people wash their hands too much, maybe mm -hmm. 100 times per day. So if you, if you question why that person is doing that from a scientific perspective, what you'll see is that they're doing that to avoid the feeling state of anxiety. Anxiety mm -hmm. goes five, six, seven, eight, nine. They go to the bathroom or wash their hands, and it drops from a nine to a three as a hypothetical example. So that quick plummet from nine to, to three, that six-point drop of anxiety, negatively reinforces the behavior. If you imagine a mouse in a box and it presses a lever uh, in the box and it gets a piece of cheese, that's called a positive reinforcement. When the creature does something, a positive result occurs, and the creature will want to do that behavior again going forward. Negative reinforcement is just the inverse. If the mouse is in the same box, same lever, but now it's getting a light shock to its poor little paws. And if it presses the, shock, uh, the lever, the shock will terminate and turn off. Quickly, the mouse will learn, press lever, shock turns off, press lever, next time there's a shock. So when we engage in some behavior, when we experience a reduction in anxiety, we're highly inclined to go back to that behavior again, like hand washing in, in the case of OCD. Mm -hmm. Worry is a very subtle and sneaky version of the same thing. Worry is really not anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, dogs uh, can't worry like us because they can't tell time like us, but they can certainly feel anxious any dog owner can observe unless you have a particularly mellow pet. Um, so w w what anxiety is telling us is don't just sit there, do something. Something you value is threatened. Uh, so take action to protect whatever uh, and defend against whatever threat is out there. Well, sometimes, as we talked earlier in the segment, uh, we're anxious for no particular reason. Perhaps it's, uh, it's, a, it's a just a product of our genetic makeup. Perhaps it's a reaction to stress. It's a, it's a product of automatic thought processes, all sorts of variables, uh, including seasonal factors, other medical conditions, can produce this apprehensive state, this, this feeling of being threatened. Well, this feeling tells us, don't just sit there, do something. So what do we do? Well, we look around the world, we find something to worry about, and then we think about it in a perseverative way over and over and over again. Yeah. It's like we're shouting back to anxiety. We're not just sitting there. We've looked around the room, the world rather, found something that's the threat, and now we're thinking about it with our mic. Yeah. And believe it or not, if you measure someone's anxiety with a skin conductance sensor, which provides an indication of how anxious we are on a biological level, you'll see a, a small reduction in anxiety when a person worries. This is for a chronic worry. Because just like a person with OCD who washes their hands, or a mouse that presses a lever to turn off a shock, worrying is a way of not, not just sitting there, but doing something. We're creating this illusion of control, this illusion of doing something instead of just sitting there. Mm -hmm. What reward is a very modest, it's not like OCD where it drops from 9 to 3. It drops from 9 to 8.5 or 8.25. 8 but still, it's enough of an illusion of control and, and, a, and a few feeling that we'll, we'll be inclined to keep worrying. There's more to the story than that, but that's the gist of it. Well, it's funny because that's what I remember, you know, was tied to the anxiety was me like we would be getting ready to go somewhere and i still have it i mean it's it's one of the things i have that i just carry with me and it's just baggage that i i'm less worried about using worry than uh in the past but i i have anticipatory anxiety like right before a trip i'm just going to be a bear you know because right. i just want to get going i just want to you know i just can't take that feeling of sitting around not doing anything and that so i'm very 
much relating to what you're saying. And I remember when I was at my high anxious state, that's what I would do. I would pace around right before we were going to go somewhere. Like I have what, where, wore down floors, right? Oh, what, what if this happens when I go out? What if that, you know, the what ifs. And that's, right. that's the game you play, which of course, eventually you learn you can't predict the future and you can't change the past. So let's focus on the now. Right. <laughs> you know, what if? Well, once, you know, that's, that's where I like mindfulness. You know, as a coach, I'm a mindfulness coach. And, and I think once people get to the point of being able to live in the present, then it's to practice to live in the present, right? Because you can easily fall back into the future game, what if, or the past game. Oh, this happened to me, so it's going to happen again. You know? Right. And, a and, powerful tool. Yeah. And, and I think it's getting bigger and bigger. And it's, it's something that maybe other areas of the world do that we're just allowing ourselves to, to learn more about, you know, right. so, so like yoga is big with me because it's, it's a focused activity. So it's yeah. almost like what you're saying, instead of focusing on all these other things, you know, this, this teacher is telling you get in this position and you're working your best to practice to do that. Mm -hmm. And of course it's always a practice. So the other problem is a lot of us anxiety people are perfectionists, right? You probably see a lot of people who are like, you know, worried all the time because things aren't perfect. Yes. Yeah. Perfectionism is a, is a major uh, symptom of anxiety for some people. Yeah. So what other uh, thinking errors are contributing to anxiety? So where is one of them? What else do we do? Well, we tend to make there's two fundamental thinking errors that uh, often show up in anxiety. We tend to overestimate the likelihood of bad things happening and underestimate our ability to cope with a negative event should it actually occur. So if the realistic chance of losing one's job is 5%, we tend to think it's 50%. That's overestimating the likelihood of that negative thing happening. But more importantly, if we could do quite fine with the loss of a job, you, you know, relying on our resources and, uh, and networks to find another job, for example, we tend to uh, overlook our own resilience in that capacity. Mm -hmm. So we're routinely overestimating the likelihood of negative things occurring and underestimating how well we could cope if they should come to pass. So those are two very common thinking errors that we see. Mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I definitely relate to that. And, and of course, like I was telling you beforehand, you know, I have a son in college, so I know right now, you know, you're like, do you do this full time? I can't yet. You know, I don't have the income stream yet, but, right. but it's my passion. And, and I know come two years from now, assuming he does well enough and graduates, um, I'll be there. You know, I'll be in a situation where, hey, if I lose my job, I'm done with that. My house is paid for, you know, I've got myself in a situation. And I do think a lot of the time people are in situational anxiety. So like I just talked to someone and that's what it was all about. You know, they were, they were stuck at their parents' house again because their life took a turn and Right. They were, you know, and, and it's that that feeling like life, I, I try to explain, life just needs to happen sometimes and you have to let it do that and, re and realize, you know, that happiness and sadness are fleeting emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, I think we expect to be happy all the time and, and that leads to a lot of anxiety when things aren't going our way for a period. It's not normal to be happy all the time or, or sad all the time. Right. Know? We're built to experience a range of, of feeling states and emotions. Yeah, and I tell people, if you get 50-50, you did it right. You know, that's life. If you get 60-40, you're living really good. You know, and anything above that's like a dream. You know, it's just life's meant to be a balance, and and it's even. Um, so what good things happen to us? What is really the, the good thing that we, we go through? When, when we reduce that avoidance issue and start facing our problems head on? I would say there's, there, there's a, a lot of remarkable benefits, but there's three big ones that jump to mind. Uh, the first is um, anxiety reduction. Uh, that, uh, I wouldn't say this is necessarily the most important, but it's the one people are looking for the most. You know, our brain is producing anxiety to, to make us engage in avoidance. Don't just sit there, do something it says. You know, uh, look around your world, find what's threatening, and take action to prevent that from occurring. When we don't listen to that message, of course, in the absence of anything actually threatening us, it's like our brain is efficient. And uh, on a scientific level, there's these two phenomenon, uh, habituation and extinction. Mm -hmm. uh, that 
but really it's, it's useful to think of it as our brain just being efficient. It's saying, hmm, I'm producing anxiety to make this guy uh, take avoid an action. He's not doing anything at all. He's not running or hiding or planning or protecting when he doesn't need to. And nothing bad has happened. He hasn't been eaten or starved or been ostracized by his, uh, by his uh, clan. Uh, so life is going on. So why bother producing anxiety if he's not obeying its orders and nothing bad is happening? Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a thumbnail version of the mechanics of what happens. But routinely in cognitive behavioral therapy, or any form of, of where we see a remarkable avoidance reduction, you have remarkable anxiety reduction. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen uh, overnight. Mm -hmm. That's still, by the way, ra much more rapidly in the case of fear or panic. Mm -hmm. You'll see radical reductions in panic and fear over the course of eight to 12 sessions. Uh, you know, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for panic disorder is 85 to 90% effective, and people are panic free when they do that treatment often. Mm -hmm. Anxiety is a slower process, but it, the same thing occurs. So the first big benefit of avoidance reduction is anxiety reduction. Mm -hmm. Second big be benefit is, and this sounds uh, like a repeat, but it's not, is symptom reduction. So things like worry, compulsive hand washing, reassurance seeking, procrastination, uh, sometimes drug and alcohol use. There's a whole wide array of things we do to avoid anxiety. So when you're willing to be anxious and you're willing to go to point A, from point A to point B in your life without avoiding anxiety, you see substantive reduction in these symptoms that people often report are more, uh, more disruptive than anxiety itself. I mean, people come to my office and other cognitive behavioral therapists' office, uh, they don't usually say, I'm feeling so anxious. They say, I'm worrying all the time, or I can't, keep stop, I can't stop checking the locks or uh, I'm, I'm uh, obsessively jealous and that's disrupting my marriage or my relationship. So these symptoms are highly disruptive in a person's mm -hmm. life and experience remarkable reduction when you are willing to, to face anxiety with courage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Benefit, though, is the one I'm the most fond of and I think it's the most important. In some ways it's the most obvious that when you're, when you're able to, to, to go through anxiety instead of going away from it, that GTNA change I refer to, you're able to stay on your path in life. You're able to do and see and experience the things in your life that you're built to do and see and experience. Yeah. You're able to retain the primary tools you have to get things done and be effective. So when when we when we're when we change our relationship to, to anxiety in this manner, we're, we become more free and effective and able to to pursue things in our lives that are deeply meaningful to us. And it's not the it's not the goal people often come to therapy looking for when they're feeling distressed and strong state of peace but in my opinion it's not. yeah it's 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 funny because early like in my recovery you know i started using writing as a cathartic experience and i and i'm not afraid to share my own thing so i remember one of my one of my first articles after anxiety kind of dissipated for me was relating to you remember the bear song like you're being chased by a bear and you come to something and you can't go over it you can't go under it you have to go through it and I, so I wrote a whole thing around that concept, and it was like, you know, I was like, well, that's a pretty neat way to start thinking about it. It's like, you can't go under it, you can't go over it, you got to go through it. Right. And when you go through it, then you're not afraid of it anymore, eventually, right, eventually. Right. Um, so that was sort of the same thing, get your, you know, get your hair cut twice, you know, when, you, when you're sitting in the chair, for me, what it was, you know, focus sit in the chair and focus. Luckily, he had a big TV, so mm -hmm. stop doing what you do. Find something to focus on. Mm -hmm. or, or then, unfortunately, they got to hear me talk all the time. You know, I'm the loudest guy at the barber's chair now. You know, everybody else is quiet, you know, when we go to the barber, and, and I'm the talkative guy. So, so I don't know if they like me or not, but that's what I do. So we're coming near the end. I have a question that's a sort of one I ask all my all my guests, and I'm certainly very interested to hear your answer. But this is healthy you. So in your life, and certainly you know, as someone who works with people who are anxious, I'm sure you you stay on the awareness side. What is one of the ways that you live a healthier life today? What is one of the techniques you use in your own life? Well, as it pertains to uh, health in general, I think the basics are critical for me. Uh, you know. Reasonable, reasonable amount of healthy eating. Certainly, uh, I'm, I'm not no perfectionist there or otherwise. But health, you know, healthy eating and, and exercise and social connection is is really critical. Mm -hmm. And as it pertains to anxiety, I think I've I, I try to practice what I preach. 
I try to face things that are not dangerous but are scary. Uh, and I, I try to be aware of when I'm avoiding anxiety in, uh, in a way that's sort of in a knee-jerk capacity. And I try to uh, go through anxiety instead of going away from it. I found that to be incredibly helpful in, in producing both uh, more effectiveness but also a more peaceful life. Well, I tell you, you know, it's one of the things that I remember in sort of my last therapy session with a therapist when I was getting better, and I looked at him and I said, you know, why do you do what you do? And he just looked at me and he said, you know why. <laughs> and it's because you practice what you preach. You know, you're, if this is what you're interested in, then you, you, folk, you do it yourself. And that's a really important thing is like patient advocacy now on the internet is so great. You know, it's so great that patients who are in recovery can tell other patients what it took for them to get there. And yeah, I love cool. like sites like the Mighty or Tiny Buddha or some of these sites where, you know, they really share, hey, you know, I was there and this is what I did. It may mm -hmm. not be what someone else needs to do, but at least patient advocacy is out there and they can read all sorts of things about people. And that's why I always feel like, you know, writing is so important. So tell me how people, you know, can get in touch with you, get your book. You have a website. Oh, how thank you. How people get you? My, my book is available on Amazon. The book's called Resolving the Anxiety Dilemma. Uh, I do have a website. It's, uh, re, uh, it's uh, realanxietysolutions.com. Uh, I'm involved with uh, Twitter now. I was a, kind of a, a, a new converter to that. I'm at, uh, at anxietycbt. And uh, I practice in Connecticut, and anyone that's local is more than, uh, more than welcome to give me a call. Well, I tell you what, you know, I've read, I've read a lot of anxiety books myself. And when I read yours, I really thought, you know, that other than the anxiety workbook, so when you're in the midst of it, it had a lot of exercises, yours was probably the most researched, informative, and easy to, to understand book I've read in a very long time about anxiety. I like that. I liked all the things. I mean, everything we talked about is in your book with a lot more, you know, a lot more to come. I'm sure we could do a whole other show about a, a other set of questions that come from your book. Like I said, I've folded down many pages. So, mm -hmm. so Dylan, I, I can't thank you enough for being on the show, for being my first vodcast uh, podcast guest. And uh, I hope you have a great uh, success with the book and in the work you do helping others. You're doing, you're doing great work. Thank you so much, as are you. I really appreciate you having me. Thanks. So this is Alan Eisenberg with Healthy You. Please join us next time. Thank you for listening to Healthy University, brought to you by Bullying Recovery, LLC. This podcast does not replace the need for medical advice, professional diagnosis, opinion, treatment, or services to you or any other individual. The information provided here or through linkages to other sites is not a substitute for medical or professional care, and you should not use the information in place of a visit, call, consultation, or the advice of your physician or other health care provider. Join us next time for more Healthy University.